All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual event featuring Ferrari Carano Wines. My name is Shannon, and I'm a part of the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet social team. In honor of Women's History Month, the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet is proud to bring you this series um, of webinars with women-owned and women-run wineries and distilleries, um, products that we carry in our stores. So tonight I'm joined by Sarah Quiter, who is the executive winemaker for Ferrari Carano. Uh, she's gonna be taking through, us through a really great presentation as well as tasting four of the Ferrari Carano white wines that we do carry in stores. In addition to Sarah, we also have Chad Gibson of the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet Wines Marketing Team here. Uh, he's here to answer any and all of your questions regarding availability and inventory of the products in our stores and he also happens to know quite a lot about wine. So feel free to leave some questions for him as well. For those of you that pre-registered tonight, we're actually gonna be giving away a really awesome prize. We've got a solo stove, which for those of you that don't know, it's actually a portable bonfire pit. So awesome, something super unique, which I'm really excited about. Um, we do ask that if you are going to be entering that you are available for a local pickup, um, which would be in Concord, New Hampshire. So just be aware of that when you do um, get to the trivia question, which is how we will be picking our winner. So again, make sure you're listening really, really closely to Sarah tonight because that trivia question will be based on her presentation. So with that, I will pass it off to you, Sarah, to get started. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen uh, and my little PowerPoint presentation. I can pull it up here and put it in display mode. So um, today we are going to talk about Ferrari Carano Vineyards and Winery, and we are um, located in Sonoma County, which is about an hour north of San Francisco. And I'll tell you a little bit about the history, but we are located in uh, Sonoma County, which is an AVA that has 18 different sub AVAs, all the way from the Pacific Coast along the Russian River. There's all the way to Knights Valley, almost to um, Napa, all the way down to Southern um, Sonoma, which has got Son Sonoma Carneros, um, almost to the San Pablo Bay. So it's a broad area of Sonoma County, and we have vineyards throughout the whole area that I'm going to kind of go into um, um, in just a bit. So we um, were the history about Ferrari Carano, it's, we've been around for 36 years and we were um, originally started by Don and Rhonda Carano, which I'll go a little bit more about why they chose it, but they fell in love with Sonoma County and reminded them of home of Genoa, Italy. They're a second generation Italian and they just fell in love with the vineyards and um, the area of Sonoma County. And I, they built this winery based on their passion and love for food and wine and the hospitality aspect of uh, just entertaining. So I'm gonna, before we really get into the history, I wanna start with the wine so that we can actually drink and talk and drink and talk. I think it's kind of a fun way to do this. So I'm gonna just briefly talk about our Pinot Grigio, which is one of the first wines that um, we're gonna, we have four wines that we're gonna discuss today. Um, the first one is our 2020 Pinot Grigio. So our Pinot Grigio is grown in the Russian River um, area and it is vineyards that we have. And what we try to do, Russian River is a colder area. So it has nice acidity in the, in the air growing, the nice cool temperatures, the fog comes in, cools down the grapes at night, retains the natural acidity. So Pinot Grigio is perfect for that because you want acidity in Pinot Grigio. So we bring in the grapes really Really cold, we gently press it, we cold um, settle it, we ferment it 100% in stainless steel tanks, and then we um, stir the leaves inside the tanks once a week for about four months, and then we bottle in December. So this is a young wine, this is just, just a few months old, and we bottled it in um, January and it is released. So um, it's a little baby, but it has beautiful aromas of lychee and honey knuckle, honeysuckle, orange blossoms that I get, lemon, citrus, and apples and pears. So enjoy that while I talk about the history of Ferrari Carano. So 
like I said, um, the winery was started by Don and Rhonda Carano, and they originally came from El Dorado, um, which is a, hot a hotel and casino in Reno, Nevada. And so they had this re uh, a hotel and a casino in Nevada, and they wanted to find wine for their uh, restaurants in their um, casinos. And they love food. Rhonda actually has a, a a degree in uh, nutrition. So she loves food. And so she came down, they came wine tasting and it reminded them of Genoa, Italy with the, the soil. The soils are very similar to Italy. And they ended up just see, you know, coming down every weekend from Reno and they saw a house for sale. And it was a 60 acre piece of uh, property with 30 acres of vineyards. And they bought this little house in the country, uh, very different from the whole casino lifestyle, but they fell in love with this, this just smaller town, Sonoma County um, area, and they started making wine. And the first wine that they made was called Carano Cellars. And very, they made a Zinfandel and a Chardonnay, and they took classes at UC Davis and they really fell in love with the idea of making wine. And so in the late seventies, they started shopping around for more acreage and more um, potential to grow. And in um, 19, in the late um, nine, uh, 70s, they decided to go full bore and they made wine and our very first release um, was in 1985, it took them a few years, uh, 1985 Chardonnay and a 1987 Fumé Blanc. And so those were our first releases. Um, and it was our Fumé Blanc and our Chardonnay, which are probably our flagship um, varietals um, of Ferrari Carano. We've made those wines from day one and continue to do so. And I know that a lot of people get confused with what Fumé Blanc is. Fumé Blanc is the same as Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc, Fumé Blanc, same varietal. It's just another term, kind of like a Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio or Shiraz or Syrah. They're the same varietal, it's just a different name for it. And we've always continued to use Fumé Blanc and we will, um, even though on the label, if you look at our bottle, it actually says Fumé Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc on that. So 100% Sauvignon Blanc on that. So they, um, since that, you know, since that time from originally starting the winery, um, they acquired more vineyards. Dan, Don Carano um, definitely loved land. So he just kept purchasing vineyard after vineyard after vineyard, and mainly in Sonoma County. So Alexander Valley, Dry Creek, and Russian River are the three main areas that they have bought vineyards throughout um, Sonoma County. Um, as well as they did buy some in uh, Napa County and in Philo in Mendocino for the Pinot Noir. So, but everything is 100% certified sustainable in every single vineyard since that time. So um, we can talk a little bit about this little Fumé Blanc, 100% Sauvignon Blanc. Um, this wine is, I think it's a beautiful wine. I love this wine. Um, they call it Fumé all day, whatever you, you know, <laughs> it's a fun wine. It's a wine that what we tend to do with the Fumé Blanc is we try to open up the canopy and we open up um, the sunlight into the grape clusters so that we can actually get um, the pyrazines, the grassy green flavors to burn off. And we want more tropical, um, more uh, papaya and mango and passion fruit and guava to come out in the wine. So we get that sunlight in there. We bring in the grapes, we cold settle it. Um, we actually um, take the, all the different vineyard blocks that we have and some of it goes to barrel in older uh, leftover Chardonnay barrels. And then two thirds of the wine is stainless steel. So that one third of that neutral barrel fermented Sauvignon Blanc tends to make our wine more softer and rounder as a whole, but that acidity and the brightness that comes from the stainless steel, it's a nice little balance that comes together. You have the nice acidity, but you also have that roundness. And then you have the, um, the grapefruit and the citrus and the flavors that come through on the Sauvignon Blanc. So did I see questions? No. All right. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, so that's our Sauvignon Blanc. I know that people love it. I've had people tell me it's their 7 a.m. cleaning wine. 
they start cleaning, they crack open a bottle and they start cleaning and they drink and they just have a good time. I don't know how clean their house gets, but they have fun. It is a fun wine. It's easy. It's approachable. It's got beautiful flavors um, on the wine. And um, so grab a bottle, enjoy it. We have um, a question. You, you've you encouraged a question already. Okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Sarah, uh, let's see. Um, Cheryl on our Zoom chat is curious um, if, I don't know if you're, you might be touching up on this a little bit later, so we might be able to jump ahead, but um, your best food pairings for both of these wines. Oh, see, with the Pinot Grigio, I absolutely love oysters. I do. I like the acidity, the minerality from the Russian River um, that comes through with the oysters. Um, I just love that. It's, the Fume, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it's to me, <laughs> front porch, best friends. <laughs> no, oh, I'm teasing. Um, food wise, I love sushi. I love sushi and the fume. I can eat sushi and fume all day long. And, um, uh, but it is something that is a nice, um, I always think it starts the evening, like a little Sauvignon Blanc. You kind of, um, you know, start with the Sauvignon Blanc with, um, the, you know, a salad or an appetizer with your meals. Um, definitely fish or seafood, um, ceviche, um, tuna, tartare. It's beautiful. Here's so. an interesting one. Laura just shared that she likes her fume with maple bacon pizza. Oh, I got to try that one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I've never had that, but that sounds great. Wow. I think of the maple and the, the spice that comes through with the maple flavor with the, the um, Sauvignon Blanc. I think that'd be fun. All right. I got to try that one. I know. We're, we're, we're taking notes on our side. <laughs> okay. All right. So... Um, a little bit about me. So, you know, people ask me, how did I get into this? I did not plan to be a winemaker. I actually, um, I went to college and I was a, a biology major um, locally. And I started working off of the docks on the boat, <laughs> off of the dock boats uh, in Bodega Bay. And so I was working for the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. And so my job was to, you know, these big draggers would come go fishing all day and then bring in the fish and the ladies on the dock would fillet the fish and um, take the carcass and put the car fish carcass in the pile. And my job was to take the fish carcass with a hacksaw and actually take these um, ear bones out of the skull of the rockfish and they were called otoliths. And they, they're like these little bones, ear bones in the rockfish that had rings like trees. So if we were depleting our resources, these ear bones would be getting smaller and smaller. Well, I would come home every day smelling, I had gloves on, I smell like fish. I'd find a scale in my hair and I just, I just didn't like the smell of fish. I'm like, I didn't want to come home smelling. And I just didn't like it. I was like, I would come home like almost cry because I can't do this another day. And so I quit. I didn't know what I was going to do. And at that point, I heard that Ferrari Corona was hiring. It had already started harvest. I came in for an interview. There was things fermenting. I remember walking in and I smelt the, the citrus and the apple and the floral and the peaches of all these things fermenting. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love it. Um, and then I realized that winemaking is actually biology. It's the yeast converting sugar to alcohol, bacteria, you know, malic to lactic on the malolactic. And um, so there's yeast and bacteria. And at the end of the day, you have a bottle of wine with your family and friends and you don't smell like fish. I was like, okay, <laughs> I was it. I loved it. And I never looked back. And so I, um, that was 30, 25 years ago at Ferrari Crono. And so I did work a few years at Ferrari Crono and then I went to Jordan Winery. Um, and when I worked with um, Rob Davis at Jordan Winery. He was the one who really was my true mentor in winemaking where um, I walked vineyards, I traveled with him, I um, tasted with him. He inspired how to look at wine, how to um, make wines that are consistent and based on quality. And um, so I ended up, uh, he inspired me to go to Davis and get a degree in winemaking. So I went, I left Jordan and got a degree in winemaking at UC Davis. 
And when I came back to Ferrari Chrono, I asked for a reference. And at that point, Ferrari Chrono, Don and Rhonda had um, built a red wine facility. So there's two facilities within Ferrari Chrono now, a white wine facility and a red wine facility. And I had come back right when they finished building it and they split the staff up. So it was perfect timing. They needed somebody. I adore Don and Rhonda. So I was like, yes, I'm in. I came back and that was what, 18 years ago. And so um, since that time, the winemaker had left, George Bursick, the original winemaker, and um, the red winemaker, Aaron Piotr, had left. So now um, I had overseen um, both wineries, for Econo, both the red and the white winery, as well as they had a little Pinot Noir um, uh, winery in Anderson Valley. So oversaw that. But what I think is really cool about overseeing it um, each winery has two women winemakers at each winery. So it was actually, we have a team of women winemakers. It's all women here. And so talking about women history month, um, I think it's pretty special that um, we have all worked 16, 17 years together. We work really well together. We have fun together. We all have um, different tastes and sensory aspects, but we all kind of tr tr trust each other. You know, we know our, um, what we're most sensitive to. And so we all trust each other with our analysis and our smelling. So it's kind of a great team. Absolutely love our team here. So I'll move on to our Chardonnay, our 2018 Chardonnay. So our Chardonnay is grown mainly in Alexander Valley. And our Alexander Valley um, has, it's a warmer growing region in um, Sonoma County, but we also blend in a little bit of our Russian River Valley fruit and our um, Napa Carneros um, appellation. And, you know, Chardonnay is beautiful. I think there's so many different clones of Chardonnay that we have in all our different ranches. And I don't know if you know about, I don't know, I always try to describe clones of Chardonnay as like apples in a grocery store where, you know how you go to the grocery store and there's Granny Smith and there's the Fuji, there's the Red Delicious. They're all apples, but they all taste different. They all have different acidities and brightness and flavors. Chardonnay clones are like that. So you have apple clones, you have citrus clones, you have peachy clones, you have floral clones. And we have so many different types of Chardonnay clones within our vineyards that when we put the wine together, we have all these different ranges, all these different blocks. We put it together, you have this wine that has a complexity of fruit flavors that are is the base and the foundation of our wine. Um, we also put the wine through malolactic fermentation. So it is about 85% through malolactic. So you do get a little creaminess to the wine, a little buttercream. And then you also have about 25% new French oak. So there's a little nuance of a hazelnut and a graham cracker spice that comes through on the oak profile that we um, have on our wine. So it was cute because Donna Rhonda had flown to Burgundy um, when they were trying to um, establish the winery and they wanted to find what kind of uh, Chardonnay they wanted to make. So they were in Burgundy and they were tasting at this um, rest, you know, it was like a hotel um, bar and the psalm there was like, oh, try this, try that, try this. And Don's like, I like this one. I want to know about the oak. I want to know about the fruit. And the gentleman behind the tasting, he was like, oh, you want to know about the oak? Get in the car. Let's go down the street. So he took Don and Rana down the street and he took him to this cooper, this burgundy cooper. And um, it's a, 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 the friendship and the relationship with Claude Gillet and now his son Laurent Gillet is our, our cooper that we use. It's one cooper and it is such a distinction of our wines and that's that consistency on our brand is there's that sweet graham cracker hazelnut spice that comes through on our Chardonnays that is distinctive to the Barrel Cooper from the history. And so they come over every year, they're the sweetest family and they are, a, they're just, it is like um, part of our history of our wines, so. That's a little bit about our Chardonnay. Um, 
So here's a picture if, of our vineyard. So if you look at the picture to the left, it, you have Dry Creek, Russian River, and Alexander Valley. And all the little white marks are our vineyard sites throughout Sonoma County. So you can see from this photo, you have quite a few branches of our Chardonnay um, sites that we grow grapes all through um, the area. 21 certified estate vineyards um, that are um, what we try to do really um, we don't, we just want to protect, um, the environment. And so what we do with our, um, you know, our stewardship is what we, we definitely work with, uh, fish friendly farming, the California department of fish and game. We have vineyards that are so close to schools and rivers and creeks that we definitely do everything we can to protect the environment, protect people, protect our workers. And so we even have done so much work with um, these government agencies to actually take out non-native species and put back um, natural California species of plants within the, um, the areas, which I think it makes me feel so good. We do um, hawk perches, drought tolerant plants. Um, this, uh, what he said, the biodegradable uh, tree sap. Um, all our vineyards, um, we put this, um, this, uh, this, uh, this oil that's tree sap on our road so that you don't have dust flying everywhere, but it's all biodegradable and natural and it's fantastic. I love it because you don't get dust everywhere, but it is a lot of people are like, wow, it takes a lot of effort, but it is something that it, we do it in, with the environment in mind. Sarah, do you think that, that the environmental stewardship that you guys are working on has any um, thing to do with the fact that you have that biology background? Or are you the big influence there? <laughs> no, I think I think it really comes down from Donna Rhonda. It came from them originally. And I just think that it started with them. They really were um, just that it, they cared. And so it trickled down to all of us. And yes, I care too. I think nowadays we all have to care with our carbon footprint. Everything we do, we really are striving to um, be sustainable. Like some of the things that we, on this um, slide here is like drip um, irrigation. We look at our moisture levels within our plant to decide when to uh, irrigate. We don't want to just throw water on the plant if it, you know, so we're really monitoring our levels of water so we can irrigate as min as less as possible. We don't use um, over uh, water for frost protection, we have air fans so that we're not using water. I mean, I think in California, you have to watch our water. I mean, we're getting a half an inch of rain today, um, but we are in a drought this year. Um, we've, we normally get 30 inches a year and we're only at 12 right now. So we're not even at a half of um, the inches that we normally. So water um, con conservation is I think priority number one. And within the winery, and within the vineyard, we're always trying to do what we can to recycle water and to um, use as little as possible. So we also have a, um, uh, we do um, get H2A workers from Mexico and we have a family, uh, multiple families that come year after year. And in the houses that we provide for them, um, we feed them, we house them, um, we take care of them, and we also have their their houses that is 100% efficient. Um, solar, um, all their appliances, everything we can do, it's it, little things like that. We just definitely make an effort to um, be cognizant of what we are putting, you know, using is in, for the environment. Oh my gosh, already on our last wine. So our reserve wine, our reserve Chardonnay is um, a Chardonnay that is from our oldest vineyard that we have. Um, the vines um, are over 20 years old. It is a vineyard in Napa Carneros. It is a, a clone of Chardonnay. Um, it's called the Winty Clone which is um, a winery lake clone. And it is a clone of Chardonnay that has hens and chicks. And what that means is that the cluster in itself has big berries and small berries. 
And what that means is that they have different flavor profiles within just one cluster. So you have some nice berries that have more citrus and lemon, where other ones taste more peachy and floral, and you have it all in one cluster. Instead of mixing all the different ranches, it's actually all in one um, cluster. And it's I love this because um, it's always like a, a mix of flavors that it's kind of interesting. And so when the fruit comes in, we whole cluster press it. Um, it is one of those vineyards that um, it's located right cl so close to the San Pablo Bay that the cool uh, fog comes in. This retains its natural acidity so well. So this wine is it got beautiful weight and depth because of the age of the vine as well as the growing area um, that it can handle a little bit more um, oak. We do put this wine um, with 40% new French oak. So it, it's the same Chalet oak like I was talking about from Burgundy, but it just has um, the flavor and the structure of the wine that can handle a little bit more. Um, it does go through 100% malolactic fermentation. So it's a little bit of that California Chardonnay, the big, bigger, buttery, oakier um, Chardonnay that, you know, some people say they don't like, but this is our number one selling Chardonnay in our um, tasting room. So. Sarah, so, you're yeah. open. Oh, you might touch upon that in this one. Yeah, so this is where, this is a photo of our winery in uh, the uh, Dry Creek Valley. So our, our, the location of the winery is in Dry Creek Valley in Healdsburg area. And at, if you haven't been, please come out to Ferry Crano because it is such a beautiful, um, we have five acres of gardens and the gardens in itself are absolutely stunning. There's um, at something blooming at all times. And in particular, right now, we have our tulips um, starting to uh, bloom. You can see in the photo, we plant anywhere from 10 to 17,000 blo um, blooming tulips a year. And we have a tulip pop line. You're like called to check and see what's blooming. But I do believe that our garden is, there's always something blooming at every time of the year. The way that they've, um, Rhonda and the gardeners designed the, the gardens is that there was always something. It's absolutely stunning and you get lost. We have master gardening um, clubs that come out because there's some unique species of plants that have been planted throughout the years. There's a fountain, there's um, a beautiful uh, veranda where you can taste and you can overlook Dry Creek Valley. We actually just opened for Sunday brunches too. We actually are serving Sunday brunch at the winery. Um, we're also doing some uh, tasting profiles throughout the winery. So within the, the, the gardens, we're actually doing tastings in the gardens. So it's, it's fun. So please come out to uh, Ferry Corano. And if you can't, um, the website, you can order online. All We do have wines that we make um, besides the ones I talked about today. Some wines that we don't normally distribute, but we do sell them only online or at the tasting room. So please log on to the website um, anytime. It would be great. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you, uh, everyone's seeming to really want to go on a road trip now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you guys are open, which is awesome. Um, a couple of random questions that have just kind of come up. Um, Karen's actually curious. You um, referenced the malolactic fermentation. She just doesn't know what it is and is hoping you okay. might be able to explain it. So malolactic fermentation, there's two primary fermentations. There's primary fermentation, which is yeast converting um, sugar to alcohol. And then there's secondary fermentation, which is malolactic fermentation, which is bacteria converting malic acid to lactic acid. And what that means is in, in the grapes, in all grapes, you have a, a naturally occurring acid called malic acid. And what the bacteria does is it makes it... Um, to a softer lactic acid. And what it's doing is, you know, the, the acid in a green apple, that's a lot of malic acid in a green apple, but the acid in milk and softer, creamier, it's converting it and makes the wine softer. So. Makes sense. Yeah, that's uh, malactic. <laughs> um, okay, Sharon is actually curious where the name Ferrari Carano came from. 
Okay, so um, like I said, Don Carano was from Genoa, Italy, and his mother's name is Amelia uh, uh, Ferrari. So uh, Ferrari is uh, like the United States of Smith. You know, there's Ferraris all over Italy, but um, uh, it is not, it doesn't have anything to do with a car, even though Don and Rhonda have a Ferrari. <laughs> Um, it has nothing to do with the car, um, but it is a family name uh, on his mother, his grandmother's side, and um, Carano is his father's name. So they, the two, two family names they put together. Awesome. All right, we've got another question. This one um, is regarding the wildfires um, and if they had any impact on the vineyards. Unfortunately, um, this last uh, harvest was probably the hardest harvest I've ever had in my 25 years of being a winemaker. I think um, you've got COVID, um, of making sure that all the employees are safe and um, trying to uh, make wine in an environment where you have to stay six feet apart when you you are just moving and going. Um, that was very difficult. And then let alone when you had um, a fire season that started on August 17th. It was historically one of the earliest harvests we've ever had a fire. Usually it's in October, late, late October. Um, so this harvest was more difficult. I think we had fires throughout California, um, Oregon, Washington. <laughs> the whole West uh, Coast seemed to be on some sort of fire watch. Um, what we ended up doing is we carefully selected all of our wines and we tested the grapes um, before we picked anything. And so um, the white wines though, it is interesting with white wines, you can um, press and you don't have to ferment on the skins. Um, so you don't extract the smoke. So the Fumé Blanc that you had and the um, Pinot Gris, the white wines did not, you, you know, even though you made it, you've tested it all throughout the whole process. None of it came back with smoke paint. In the numbers, it doesn't smell like it. Unfortunately, when you ferment wine on the skins, all the red wines, you just start extracting the smoke. So we will not make any red wines in 2020. So yes, it did affect us as a company um, and as an industry. I don't know very many people who will be able to make a wine that does not smell like smoke taint in 2020 with the red wine. It's a tough, it was a very, very difficult year. But we're, you know, harvest is full five months away and we're just, oh, please. <laughs> and you're we getting rain. To, you know, you just, you just hope that this is not something that's gonna occur every single year because that was a tough one last year, definitely. We've got rain in the horizon, so we're, we're, <laughs> we're gonna pray. Yeah. Something else happens. Um, okay, we've got a question from Tracy. She's curious how long in the new French oak barrels um, the Chardonnays are staying. Okay, so um, the Chardonnay, like I said, was the, the Sonoma County is 25% new French oak and the, the reserve is 40% new French oak. Um, we usually have that wine in those new barrels for about 10 months. And then we take it out of the 10 months. Um, for the reserve though, um, we put we blend it in 10 months and then we put it back to neutral barrel and we um, age it for another six months and then bottle it. But it's really only a portion of the blends for 10 months. Awesome. All right. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, Mark is curious. Uh, you talked about a little bit about the food pairings for the first two bottles, but he's curious about the Chardonnays. Ah, the Chardonnays. Well, I don't know. I think a Chardonnay pairs well with so many different types of food. To me, I think of um, chicken and, um, you know, seafood and fish and lobster. The reserve Chardonnay and lobster, oh my God, it's just so succulent. Um, I like the, the acidity on the Sonoma County is nice with, it's brighter. 
Um, so it pairs, I mean, they both pair. I think that the Reserve Chardonnay is a richer wine. So you have to kind of, um, you know, pair it accordingly, I think, um, where I think you might have a little bit more diversity on the Sonoma County with a broader range because it, it's got, it's not as, it's just more lighter, but, but more um, brighter too. So there's more acidity that goes through on that wine. Uh, Laura, who gave the maple bacon pizza recommendation, says lobster ravioli with Parmesan tomato cream sauce. All right. I, I like the way she eats. eats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Let, let's have dinner sometime. <laughs> <laughs> You're cooking. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, Thomas is actually curious, are the wines vegan? Vegan uh, is when, it, yeah, you know, it's hard because we do do use some fining agents um, that help settle the wine. Um, one of them is an icing glass, which settles um, the white wines and it is uh, made with fish bladder. It is something that a lot, it's quite common. So unfortunately it is not vegan. But it's something that you you settle it and then you filter it and I don't I, yeah it's not vegan I guess <laughs> I want I want to say yes it's it's vegan but I can't but you know what that not all wines this is uh, something that we use um, on our white wines but our red wines. Um, a lot of them, we don't do any fining agents on the uh, red wine. So we could, you know, depending on the wine, there are some wines that have some pretty good tannins. We use some egg white fining on that. Um, so um, those wouldn't be vegan. So it just, you'd have to double check with, um, uh, you know, with the website, go to customer support and check every single wine because the, we'd have to look at the, the additives that we added that year. Is it a high tannin year? Do we use egg whites or not? So sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. So it'd have to be vintage uh, specific. But please check in because I think it's worth it. We've got some nice wines. Sure. All right. So Tracy's curious if you have any thoughts um, or future plans for making smaller like travel wines, like, or maybe even like a box wine variety. Um, and when she says like the travel wines, it's like the, the beach, you know, that you can get like the carton, like almost like a single serve type of situation. You know, I don't know. Um, maybe um, there, you know, we do make little uh, 375 splits, this like half bottles on our Sauvignon Blanc. Um, they're perfect because it's, I like, oh, perfect. It's not too much, but it's still made out of glass. Um, so um, it is something that is, um, we haven't talked about it yet, but it is something if you keep asking, we might just do it. <laughs> you know, I know that canned wine is super popular. I've had them myself. I love them because they're so friendly, um, especially with the um, environment. I definitely um, see us going down that road, maybe. We'll do you see. see that doing anything to the overall taste profile of any of them? I've heard, actually, I have a seminar next week. Um, they're winemakers, you know, we all get together and we do all these seminars. We do smoke taint seminars and, um, you know, can seminars and any kind of research with um, sustainability, anything. Um, there is one on cans and off aromas on canning um, wine. So um, some people have had problems. Um, it's kind of like when screw caps came out at first, people were worried about the reduction on the screw caps. Um, you just have to kind of make wine possibly differently for the different types of closures and bottling package. All right, so this one's probably gonna be a tough one for you. It might be the toughest of the night. Um, and it's what is your favorite Ferrari Carano wine? I don't, can't do that. <laughs> Maybe it's just your favorite for the day. Tomorrow you can have a different favorite. You know, they, they say that you can't pick your favorite child. Do you have a favorite child? I don't have any kids, so I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're different. You have different children, right? For different, some are better at other things, right? You have different personalities. And this is how I look at it. It's like, I tend to 
um, be a, a I, it, it depends on my food. I will like my certain wine with the food that I'm having. Um, if I'm having steak, I'm not going to have a, a Pinot Grigio with my steak. I'm going to have our, you know, a cab. I'm going to have our Zinfandel. I'm going to have our Sienna. Um, that's what I choose my children <laughs> and my wine <laughs> with the food. Uh, how about um, wine glass preference? Do you have a certain style or brand that you prefer? You know, it's so funny. And I know that um, there's been so many studies on um, uh, Riedel and the glassware and how important it is. I know that I've experienced, um, you smell better with certain glassware. Absolutely, 100%. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, the Riedel has across the board. I'm having them actually what I'm drinking right now. Um, but I'm, I've, I've been known to put it in the, you know, the, you know, the jars, the canning jars, <laughs> just because I want a glass of wine and okay, I'm not that picky too. <laughs> we, hey, we've heard it. We've heard a variety. Some people are all about specific wine glasses. Some people say, hey, give me a solo cup and I, you know, I'll still enjoy it just the same. I do like, I'll stick to the glass. I don't like the plastic. Um, I de definitely will stick to glass. How about chilled versus, you know, an ice cube? Are you against any of that? No, I I add ice cubes to my wines. <laughs> I think people like if to it's not cold enough. Of it. <laughs> yes, I'm guilty. I mean, sometimes, yeah. I sometimes don't think ahead. And I'm like, I want a glass of white wine and it's not cold and I'll just add an ice cube in it. So yeah, I know it's not good and I'm a winemaker and I shouldn't do that. <laughs> We're all humans. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Tracy did not like the idea of drinking wine out of a solo cup. So she's yeah, I agree. Backing you on the glass, the glass wine or the some type of a glass. You know, it's like I think of, you know, when you travel and you go to Italy and they or in France where they have the little short glasses, they're kind of fun and different. I like that. And so sometimes I'm not as particular. And it, and maybe it's because I, I have traveled and I've seen wine be poured in so many different types of um, vessels that you just kind of it's wine it sh should be enjoyed you know you sometimes it gets too complicated you just want to enjoy it yeah don't put too many rules on it just yeah it's fermented grape juice just enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> all right janine is curious so this is probably a little bit more to your career but okay if you've ever had like a favorite batch of, of wine that you've created, or if you've ever made any blends? You know, for the last 25 years, it's definitely been, um, there's been good years and bad years, hands down. Um, there are the, the, the bad years are the years when the rains come early and um, you've got the fires. I mean, the fires have been difficult. You remember those more sometimes, but then when the good ones come, it's just one of those vintage that you don't have to do anything. You don't have to like cut and turn and oh, pull this in early. It's not ready. There's a lot of decisions. Like when you have fire and smoke, sometimes you're picking based on, I don't want smoke taint. I'd rather have unripe fruit than smoke taint. So you have to weigh your odds on, um, how to make the wine sometimes the vintages that you don't have to be pushed to pick and you are picking based on ultimate ripeness and flavor profiles of, of the grapes and you're walking and you're like oh my god it's perfect pick it right now and you get it those are the most beautiful magical harvest that you love they're there and that's what i'm hoping for the 21. we all are we all <laughs> want to see the 2021 vintages i think we're all ready to get back to, you know, some sort of normalcy, even if it just means having a nice red in 20. Yes, and I know that um, one of the things about the COVID, it's wonderful, um, wine is considered essential because we need our alcohol. <laughs> um, I know um, we at the winery all got vaccinated already. Um, we are just getting our second shot at this point. Um, so it'll be nice to be able to come to work you know, to make wine, to bottle wine, because we've been busy, we've been working every day since being um, very, very careful, but it'll be nice to actually 
you know, take a deep breath and not be so worried. So we'll be good. That's actually a great segue. Um, Belinda's curious if um, with the current state, if you're working with the travel industry at all in California to, you know, encourage visits to the vineyard. Yeah, we are. The one thing that we've been doing since COVID is um, we are doing, we've changed. Every business has changed because of it. Um, we are doing more outdoor tastings. And it's actually, you know, here we have gardens, the gardens. We do outdoor tastings in our garden. Why haven't we done this sooner? You know, one of those things that you have such this beautiful California weather. Um, we are there's there's outdoor dining there's outdoor tastings um we're doing pizza ovens there's so much more outdoors that it's i think it's fantastic i actually love it so um we are um remodeling all our patio furniture you know you take these opportunities to remodel everything and um, make it more of an inviting outdoor um tasting venue which normally you didn't do so you have to yeah. think outside the box to work with the times Mm-hmm. Love it. I wish we could do that outside right now where we are at, but oh. <laughs> we kind of talked about before the event, we're not quite there yet, but soon enough, some of our um, restaurants in New Hampshire are already prepping for outdoor seating and some, I think, have some available, you know, obviously we have our heaters and everything, but it's been, it's been a very trying winter <laughs> to stay inside. Um, but so let's see, we've got another question um, you know, you've been in the industry um, for quite a bit now. Um, you know, have there been changes that you've seen other wineries um, or vineyards do that either you agreed with or, you know, are thinking maybe you guys would like to try or are there things that you've seen that people have done that you're like, ah, you know, we, we definitely won't do something like that. I think um, one of the things that Ferrari Chrono stands for is um, consistency. And I feel like um, what, you know, it's like Coca-Cola when they change the recipe of the you know, classic um, California, you know, the Coca-Cola, there's up in arms. I feel like one of the things that we've strayed, stayed true to at Ferrari Chrono is a, a stylistic consistency within our brand and our wines. Our Fumé Blanc is our Fumé Blanc. Our Chardonnay is our Chardonnay. We use the same oak for 35 years from Claude Gelet. We use, you know, the same percentage of oak versus stainless steel in our Fumé Blanc. You have these wines that are made with consistency where other wineries have changed up. They get a new winemaker, then they're going to do change this. They're going to do this. I feel like we've been so consistent at Ferrari Crano. And I think I don't, I think that's I'm proud of most of is that we're not following trends. We're not going down avenues of, Oh, what do people like today? Or what this we've stayed true. So, awesome. All right. Oh, Tom is curious if Ferrari Corona will always stay an independent winemaker. An independent winemaker? Well, I've been the second winemaker since, since George. Um, I will, I, my heart and soul is here. I will always try my, I will always um, be here as long as I can be here. You know, it's one of those things you, I've seen 25 years is a long time <laughs> and you just kind of, you care. And so um, I hope that they don't, um, we don't, um, you know, I hope it continues. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think it might be a great time to do our trivia question based off of your presentation, which is so awesome. Um, let's see, we have um, trivia questions. Everyone get your typing fingers ready based off of Sarah's presentation tonight. Again, reminder, um, it would be a local pickup in Concord, New Hampshire. So if you're not willing to make the drive, um, please uh, don't enter. Uh, so, what was the first vintage of wine released by Ferrari Carano? So we're looking for the year. All right, Tom Brewer, the correct response was 1985. Looks like a lot of correct answers on here. We also have some correct um, varietals as well. Those first two 
um, was the Fumé Blanc and the Chardonnay. So congratulations, Tom. I will reach out to you via email to collect um, some of your information and I will pass that along to Christian who will coordinate the pickup for your new solo stove, which is awesome. Um, one of the best prizes I've seen um, in some of these events. So congratulations to you. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been so much fun. I've learned a lot. I'm sure you have as well in, in regards to food pairings because we're all going to head to <laughs> Laura's house. I'm going to go get some maple <laughs> pizza. <laughs> um, thank you, Chad, for helping us out um, with the overall availability and also sharing the pricing on these products right now in the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets, which co coincidentally, they're all on sale right now. Um, so if you are interested, please head to the stores and pick up any of these bottles. Um, they're all great. Um, if you have enjoyed tonight's event, make sure that you head to our Eventbrite page uh, for upcoming events that you'd like to join. Uh, and again, if you have any further questions from tonight's event, any questions for Sarah, Chad, please don't hesitate to reach out on Facebook uh, and we'll do our very best to get all of them answered for you. Again, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been so much You're fun. Welcome. We hope to see thank you everyone for joining. very, very soon at our Winter Wine Spectacular. Have you ever visited that? The nope. Winter Wine Spectacular in New Hampshire, have you ever? No, but I should come. <laughs> yes, absolutely. When the next time that we can have it, which I'm fingers crossed we can have it the upcoming year, um, we'd love to have you join us. It's such a fun event. Um, and I'm sure everyone here would love to have you as well. That would be wonderful. And please come out to wine country and to Furry Corona. It's absolutely stunning here in California and things are opening up. No, nothing like a, a little wine getaway. Absolutely. We, we already have some people in the chat that are coordinating a road trip. So we'll, we'll keep you updated when we're, when we're supposed to be arriving. All right, everyone have a great night. We hope to see you all again next Wednesday night as we welcome Maria Baum of Splash Mixers. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.